Dufu, Elegies on Ancient Sites, number two. Watching leaves wither and fall, I know song use sorrow. In his elegance and erudition, I find my teacher. Thinking of him and a thousand autumns, my tears fall. That the same sadness can be felt in such different ages. In his old home between river and mountains, only his poems remain. On the abandoned terrace of clouds and rain, was it all a dream? Sadder still, the Chu palaces were wiped away. These days, the boatmen cannot show us where they stood. So we continue with Dufu's Elegies on Ancient Sites. Remember, these are poems Dufu composed uh, in the twilight of his life, in the 760s, when he was uh, quite old and sick and disappointed with his failure uh, at gaining success in office with his old age, with uh, his being far from his homeland, even though the Anushan Rebellion had been nominally put an end to the country was still in quite a lot of chaos and he found himself traveling with his family down the Jansu River Valley and down the river itself and you know he never quite managed to get back home to get back to his uh, missed Luoyang. So while he's going down the river he is visiting sites, he's seeing sites. Mm, the area that surrounds the Jansu would have been the heartland of the old state of uh, Shu. So sorry the old state of Chu. Um, also close in some of its regions to the old state of Shu. So lots of these um, references to figures from Shu and Chu appear in these poems, mainly figures that we will see, for example, in the last two of the poems of the series of the Three Kingdoms period, that is Zhuge Liang and uh, Emperor Liu Bei. But uh, also, uh, well, uh, poets from the area and from the past. So poem one made a parallelism between uh, Du Fu and uh, Yu Xin, who was a late Sixth Dynasty poet, so from the 500s uh, of the Common Era. In this poem, he makes a parallelism and a comparison with another poet from a far more remote chronological period. So the poet that is being equated to Du Fu in this poem, or the poet whose emotions uh, Du Fu is sharing after a long time and through crossing through uh, this poet's landscape is Song Yu. Very briefly, what do we know about Song Yu? Not much. So Song Yu was a poet of the very late Warring States period. He was a, a poet writing in the kingdom of Chu. We've already talked of uh, uh, Chu Juan, the minister poet who had composed uh, the Li Sao, and uh, Song Yu would have been a poet of the next generation, just as Chu Juan was a poet for King Huai of Chu and therefore lived in the very late years of, uh, of, of the 4th century. Uh, Song Yu, sorry, 4th century, yeah, in the late years of the 4th century. And Song Yu would have served, allegedly, King Xiang of Chu, the successor of uh, King Huai, during the early uh, 3rd century, so this is uh, the period from, let's say, the very late 300s, early 200s, 290, 280 BC, uh, the last half a century before the first emperor, An of Qin, managed to unify all of the warring states. Song Yu, well, like Chu Yuan, he didn't have a very happy career in office, and uh, he was mainly a composer of, of, of pretty pieces for his king, and he was allegedly frustrated at not being named for positions in office. Now, a problem with Song Yu is that, uh, how can I put it? So the first time uh, Song Yu's poems are recorded that we know of, that, that is, we have a direct transmission of his texts, or, or of a biography, uh, plus uh, texts attached uh, to him, as far as I know, is basically in the Wen Shuan Anthology. The Wen Shuan Anthology adjudicates 16 texts to Song Yu, uh, 
Most of them are full, that is, uh, prosimetric poems, rhapsodies. And the, 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 the Wenxuan was composed in the 6th century, so that would have been, at the very least, some 800 years after Song Yu had allegedly lived and written. So, uh, you know, to, 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 to try and make a comparison that's similar to uh, Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer first being referenced uh, in a 20th century anthology for the first time. And, uh, okay, we are not sure that most of those Fu uh, that are attributed to him in the Wen Xuan are really his work. They're probably uh, Western or Eastern Han recreations. But anyway, the Chinese tradition of which Du Fu is a part did believe those poems were by Du Fu, and in fact, they were taken as the most representative poems of uh, Song Yu. The other poems that are probably his are those that are preserved in an earlier anthology, the Chu Tzu, the Elegies of Chu, the Songs from the South, however you prefer to translate it. And this is the anthology that was uh, compiled in the Eastern Han Dynasty, so about 150, 180 of the Common Era by Wang Ji, and it basically compiled texts that went back to uh, the Warring States period, including Chu Juan's Li Sao, and a few poems by Song Yu, basically the um, Nine Statements or the Nine Proclamations. Now, the Nine Proclamations, uh, the beginning of it is referenced in the first couplet of this poem, so it's important uh, to note that in that poem, in the, in the Nine Proclamations, Song Yu, uh, probably for the first time, uh, it makes the equation that would become trite and commonplace in Chinese poetry of autumn sadness and the passage of time in autumn with the poet's sadness. So, you know, this becomes quintessential and stereotypical in Chinese poetry. A background, seasonal, autumn with falling leaves is naturally um, the, 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 the resonance box for the sadness of the poetic persona. And uh, Song Yu's poem starts like that, oh, so sad, so trite, autumn... Uh, with the falling leaves, uh, so sad, watching the waters go by as a friend leaves. So, uh, although, as I said, these images become very, very conventional in traditional Chinese poetry, Song Yu, is, it, you could say it's their originator, so in his poems they have a freshness and uh, an originality uh, that is absent from Du Fu's text, for example. Now, uh, as I said, Song Yu is famous for this poem, and this poem is referenced here. But later in, in, in Du Fu's poem, uh, the Fu are referenced. So, um, Song Yu had a slightly negative reputation as a Fu poet, uh, because the Confucians considered that he is, his poems dwelled too much on describing beautiful goddesses and women. Allegedly, he composed, as we say, these poems for the entertainment of King uh, Xiang, uh, while he was with the king in the Yung Men Marsh. And uh, two of these poems, especially the Fu on uh, Gao Tang and the Fu on the Beautiful Woman, the Lien Fu, uh, are poems in which uh, a beautiful goddess who dwells in a mountain is described. And it is implied that this uh, goddess, uh, which is reverenced uh, by King Xiang, comes down, visits him and has an amorous tryst with uh, innuendo and sexuality implied, you know, very oblique, in a very oblique and devious way, as is traditional in classical Chinese poetry. Uh, in fact, so much so that uh, wind and rain, which are referenced, uh, clouds and rain, which are referenced in the, in the Gao Tang Fu, uh, uh, became, you know, a, a stereotypical euphemistic image to refer to sex, uh, to a man having sex with a beautiful woman. Clouds and rain. And, you know, it's referenced also a bit here in, in Du Fu's poem. So after this very long introduction about the poet that is being referenced here, very quickly, topic of this poem, same as the previous topic. It's a lamentation at the passage of time, and it's um, a merging of Du Fu's feelings and uh, his person, his poetic person, with another poetic person of yore, of a thousand years from before his time. Du Fu feels the sadness of autumn and the passage of time, just as Song Yu's verses felt this. He looks at the landscape that Song Yu used to sing, uh, the places where he lived, the palaces uh, he sang, the terraces in which he used to dwell with his king, nothing remains. So there's this um, ubisunt element, which is so ubiquitous in medieval European poetry, but also present in, in medieval Chinese poetry. This idea of all the glorious buildings, all the great uh, 
and palaces and all the glory and power of the rulers of the past and of the poets have, you know, has gone away, has withered. Only poetry remains. And there's, you know, the, the poet's um, uh, wish and fantasy that although he too will wither away and disappear, his poetry will last. So as usual, let's uh, take a look at the poem couplet by couplet. First couplet. Watching leaves wither and fall, I know Song Yu's sorrow. In his elegance, in erudition, I find my teacher. So the first couplet, uh, clearly, it's not pointing to a site, just as the previous elegies on ancient sites was only very vaguely describing an actual ancient site, except for the region of the, of the Yangtze River with the three gorges and the five streams. So this poem begins again anchoring our poem on a poet. The poet is anchoring on a poet. In the previous poem, he, he lassoed Yu Xin. <coughs> In this poem, he's lassoing Song Yu. So he's saying, it's autumn, the leaves are falling, and I remember Song Yu's verse and Song Yu's sadness at autumn, and he is the father of this tradition. And I feel like he felt. And not only do I feel like he felt, he is a great poet of the past. So I am patterning my poetry on his. I am using him as a model. He is elegant. He is erudite. I try to imitate those traits in my own poetry. Second couplet. Thinking of him in a thousand autumns, my tears fall. That the same sadness can be felt in such different ages. So how, how, the, cyclical, how the cyclicality of time and of man's uh, suffering is evoked in this couplet. So I think Dufu's poetic persona is thinking of this poet of yore who was unhappy and who sang of unhappiness and of autumn melancholy. Dufu reads the poem, feels this. He also feels the passage of time. This poem is read in, in, in Dufu's present and it feels like something that a friend or a contemporary or he himself could have composed. But there is a thousand years behind these lines. A bridge of a thousand years separates do who from Song Yu, and it's a literal 1,000 years, like mm, Song Yu, as I said before, lived around 300 BC, and Du Hu lives in the, was writing this poem in the 760s, so it's more than three, than a thousand years afterwards. Imagine that, the, the Chinese tend to fetishize, the classical poetry tends to fetishize, you know, the tradition, the continuity of the tradition, the vast swathes of time in which texts continue to be read and written and answered back. But, you know, this is a living embodiment of this. So Dufu feels sad. He shares the feelings of, the poetic feelings of, of, of Sung Yu, and he is marveled and saddened by how time passes. A thousand years have passed, and time, the passage of time is sad because it evokes death, decay, disappearance of um, the glorious men of yore, and also the physical, the inevitable physical decay of one and the inevitable fall of one's dynasty. He cries. And he feels the same sadness. And, you know, there is this paradoxical feeling how enormous distances in time become obliterated by the same feeling that two people reading books, two people who have never known each other, who are from a thousand years of distance, who are from different territories, how these two people can commune after such a long period, crossing such vast, vast distances, how the thought of two humans, you know, can match together again and resonate. Third couplet. In his old home, between river and mountains, only his poems remain. On the abandoned terrace of clouds and rain, was it all a dream? So uh, this con the poem continues. So first we had uh, uh, an evocation of Song Yu and his sorrow, then the effect that in, of that sorrow in Du Fu, now we get a shift back to Song Yu through the landscape that Du Fu is crossing, which is Song Yu's landscape, but it's a thousand years hence, and there remain no traces of him. You know, that's what a thousand years of time does. It obliterates any of your traces, the people you lived with, your neighbours, your friends, but not only them, the cities, towns you visited, the buildings you stayed in, they have all gone away. Even the rivers might change forces, even the mountains might be eroded. And, you know, all the palaces that were glorious and big are now reduced to rubble or nothingness. So, so 
in this couplet, Dufu takes us into this uh, with the very, very dear image to a poet that all that seems solid has melted into air, that all the glorious palaces and buildings have been snatched away by Father Time. Only poetry gives you immortality, you know, like Horace, uh, Berwai, how did he say, Aere um, Perennus, yeah, words uh, lasting, stronger than marble, stronger than, than bronze, yeah, more perennial than bronze. So the poet's words, paradoxically, the poem, which seems such a, a fragile substance, you know, just some ink markings on a piece of paper. In, in some new time, it would have been some etchings, probably, on uh, bamboo slips, then tied together. Uh, in Dufu's time, there's already paper and uh, silk writing in silk also. But that, that fugitive, light brush, brush stroke flowing on the paper, so easy to destroy. Paper is so fragile, and yet its contents, those words, those poems, last longer than any human-made construction, and then many nature-built constructions. And this is epitomized here. Du Hu's traveling through the old home, the old land of Song Yu, but there's no trace of him. Probably there isn't even a tomb. Maybe the town or towns in which he lived are no longer there, or if they are, they have changed name and they retain no memory of Song Yu. Only his poems remain. And the abandoned terrace of clouds and rain, that is a reference to this terrace that I talked to you about. There was a, a an elevated terrace or mountain, Gao Tang, and, and there was a poem, the Gao Tang Fu, composed by Song Yu to please his king, about the king having a tryst in a little palace in that mountain with a goddess. And in the original poem, it's not clear. Well, it's left ambiguous if, if, if the king really dreamt that, or if he, or if he really had a, a liaison with the goddess. And, you know, this is evoked here with a double uh, resonance. Uh, not only is that story within the story, within uh, Song Yu's mm, Fu, uh, maybe all a dream, but even the palace itself, the terrace of clouds and rain, the king, all that is no longer more than a dream in Du Fu's time. It's just, it, it has no more solidity than one of his dreams. It lives through the poetry of Song Yu, but there is no longer a kingdom of Chu. There is no longer a King Xiang. There are no longer young men, marshes and terraces and palaces. That has all disappeared into the mists of time. Finally, the last uh, couplet, as usual, you know, tries to intensify and conclude the pathos of the poem and uh, the message and the feelings that the poet wants to transmit. Even sadder, sadder still, the two palaces were wiped away. These days, the boatman cannot show us where they stood. So not only is the terrace of clouds and rain abandoned, not only the home between rivers and mountains of Song Yu no longer remains. The glorious palaces, the most beautiful works of art and, uh, and the symbols of conspicuous power and luxury and beauty uh, in the service of the kings of Chu, they have disappeared. So the greatest works of art that are not literary are perishable and disappear. All the more so in the Chinese tradition, in which, as opposed to the Western tradition, palaces monuments, for the most part, are not built on solid, reliable stone. So most palaces in China were built of wood, which meant at the end of almost every dynasty, all the capitals you know, burned to the ground, and there was practically nothing left of, of, of the glorious imperial palaces, the huge wooden buildings, the golden and uh, precious jeweled uh, decorations. It all just snuffed out. So today we can only see the foundations of ancient palaces of ancient China. There's very little original architecture preserved because it is a wooden architecture. And uh, yeah, so, so Du Fu is again staring at, 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 at the point that of all works of art, only poetry lasts, only poetry perdures, only endures, only poetry um, continues after a thousand years to be present in a copied version and uh, to allow us to revive this past, which is no more substantial now than a dream. The two palaces have disappeared. Boatmen cannot show us where they stood. The, the common people no longer have any remembrance, any memory of those palaces. So the poem ends with this sad, melancholy pathos 
which you know is the same that you would imagine uh, experiencing by the romantic poets and writers in Europe when they visited old ruins and uh, you know meditated on the fall of kings. Think of Shelley's poem Ozymandias next to the statue of an emperor, uh, Ramesses II, whose name he couldn't know and he didn't know, looking at the proud statue lying in the sand. Uh, look at me, you mortals, in despair. Uh, Volney at the ruins of Palmyra, uh, American explorers entering the Yucatan for the first time in the 19th century and in, 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 in after ages and seeing the abandoned pyramids and statues of the Maya. There's this haunting, sad, melancholy feeling of the works of the humankind, the artistic achievements of humankind are destroyed by time. But then again, there's this consolation. One type of art, at least, will endure. And this type of art will continue, will not only last as a copy, it will continue to resonate and to provoke emotions in people a thousand years from then.